With a landmass that covers more than 3 million square miles, it has the longest coastline of any country. And over 9,000 lakes and rivers. plays host to one of the largest blocks of intact forest left on Earth, stretching over 1.4 billion acres. And yet, much of this great wilderness was shaped by human impact, going back thousands of years. Each of Canada's six geographic areas has its own distinct identity. A natural diversity that changes dramatically with each season. 15,000 years ago, most of Canada was buried under a thick continent-wide glacier. Eventually, as sea levels lowered, the landscape and wildlife began to emerge. A land bridge with Asia was created, allowing new life to enter North America. This may have been when the first humans arrived in this new world and began to change the environment around them. Despite human influence, Canada remains one of the wildest countries in the world. And one of its greatest natural spectacles happens each year on the Atlantic coast in the province of Newfoundland. This is as far east as you can go in North America. It has lured these special travelers to its shores for thousands of years. Humpback whales arrive here each spring, some swimming all the way from the Caribbean. They are drawn by the sheer abundance of this place, a richness that comes from the sea. Huge shoals of capelin, numbering in the millions, swim along the coast of Newfoundland each spring. These small yet nutrient-rich fish support the thriving circle of life. Atlantic cod were once here in numbers as great as the Capelin. But such bountiful fishing grounds lured the first Europeans to these shores. Today, the great schools of cod are mostly gone. But that doesn't mean the Capelin here are safe.
This area attracts the largest gathering of humpback whales in the world. These massive predators have traveled thousands of miles to be here at this time of year to feast on capillary. They haven't fed for months, and they're hungry. Whales can eat up to a ton of capillary in a single day. Since they don't feed year-round, humpbacks must eat large quantities of fish daily in these northern waters. These caplin aren't just hanging around the coast to feed the whales. They are here for a reason. To breed. Capelin are beach spawners. So to reproduce, they have to get to shore. And there is only one way to get there. They have to surf. It's often difficult to truly appreciate the life cycle of the sea, since it's often hidden beneath the surface. But when the Kaplans spawn here in Newfoundland, they literally wash up onto the shore. And dangerously within reach of a new set of predators. Capelin found along the coast of Newfoundland are in the middle of mating season, right up on the shore. Somehow, in the confusion of water, sand, and tumbling bodies, each Capelin has to find a partner. Then, as the waves recede, they have the perfect conditions for mating. The female lays her eggs while competing males flank her, fighting to fertilize them. If they're lucky, the next wave will carry them back to the sea. Many of the females survive to spawn again, but almost all the males die. Like tiny jewels, the fertilized eggs cling to the sand. Two weeks later, the larva will hatch and start the life cycle all over again.
The east coast of Canada also supports some of the world's largest seabird colonies. At Cape St. Mary's, 24,000 gannets make up this breeding colony. Like the whales, they come here every year to feast on capelin and raise their young. But the seabirds aren't the only inhabitants. This seemingly pristine natural landscape was shaped by the First Nations inhabitants thousands of years ago. The Iroquoian and Algonquian people of the eastern forests created a rich and lush homeland here. In 1679, one European visitor described these eastern oak forests as full of vast meadows, vineyards, trees bearing good fruit, groves and forests, so well disposed, one would think nature alone could not have made it. It was a fertile patchwork of oak forests and grasslands, a savanna-like habitat where wildlife thrived. Back then, East Central Canada supported huge populations of wild deer, millions more than it does today. Over thousands of years, the people here engineered their very own Garden of Eden through the careful use of fire, and not on a small scale. They were burning tens of millions of acres each year. Fire burned away the young trees, creating large grass openings in the forest and clearing the way for the larger trees, protected by their thick bark, to grow even bigger and produce more nuts and fruit. With controlled burns, these people created one of the most productive environments on the continent. While not as rich, today's forests are much more colorful due to the abundance of maple trees. Maple trees are sensitive to fire, so they were kept back by the burning of the forest. But when the burning stopped, maple trees eventually took over. One of Canada's most famous natural displays is a modern creation arising from our new relationship with forests. In winter, Maple's broad leaf is too flat and thin to protect from freezing. So each fall, the tree cuts its losses, pulling its resources back into its trunk, letting the leaves die. It's one of the most stunning displays of death in the natural world. Most of Canada is a completely different place for half the year. Winter presents a difficult set of challenges for the northern forest. Canada's boreal forest stretches unbroken across the country in a band up to 6,000 miles long and 1,200 miles wide. 25% of the world's forests are found in Canada. But for six months every year, it is transformed by snow.
Winter is a difficult season for many wild animals. Some are better equipped for it than others. Wolverines are one of the most elusive animals in the world. They are rarely seen in person, and few have ever been captured on camera. With large furry feet, it almost floats across the deep snow. And with one of the most sensitive noses in the animal kingdom, they can find food almost anywhere. Wolverines are masters at winter. You can see how this one spreads its toes with each step, expanding the surface area of her feet, allowing her to stay on top of the snow. Animals' abilities to get around in the snow were admired by the people that lived in these forests. With webbing made from the rawhide of deer or moose, stretched between strips of bent wood, they designed shoes that mimicked the effect of the wolverine's feet. Snowshoes were essential tools for travel throughout the winter. The boreal forest provides many things for the wildlife that call it home. On its far northern edge, which borders the Arctic, the forest serves as shelter for one of its most famous animals. And she's here for a very good reason. Over the winter, she gave birth in this den beneath the trees. And after five months, it must feel good to be outdoors. It's one of the few places in the world where you can see polar bears playing in the trees. These new cubs still have a lot to learn from their mother. They will spend the next two years with her before striking out on their own. As spring approaches, these bears must leave the protection of the forest to follow the retreating ice north. But some local inhabitants never leave, and many only come out at night. Squirrels are the quintessential forest dweller. These squirrels are special not only because they're nocturnal, they can fly. While they don't fly in the true sense of the word, they can glide over 160 feet between trees. Their tails act as rudders, steering them around obstacles. Flying squirrels live in all types of forests around Canada and feed on seeds from cones inside their tree homes. 
Flying squirrels stay active all year. They don't hibernate. But there are some creatures living in these northern Canadian forests that have to. On the southern edge of the great forest in central Manitoba, each spring is a magical reawakening. Red-sided garter snakes are just waking up from an eight-month-long sleep. They traveled up to 50 miles last fall, just to hibernate in these deep limestone sinkholes. Males emerge first, by the thousands. Coiling together for warmth under the early spring sun. They strain to catch the first whiff of an alluring scent. Then slowly, in ones and twos, the females begin to emerge. Emitting a pheromone that drives the males into a frenzy. Dozens of males cling to one female trying to mate. Afterward, the female will try to dislodge her partner by doing a body roll, while males try to hang on, keeping their competitors from winning the prize. Females only mate once per season. In many ways, it's surprising to see cold-blooded creatures like snakes creating such a spectacular display in the northern climes of Canada. Conditions draw them together here, since it's the only shelter deep enough underground for them to survive the frigid winter. This concentration makes it the largest gathering of snakes in the world. Further south and west from here, at the center of the country, the forest gives way to a very different landscape. The prairies. At one time, this vast grassland stretched all the way south to Mexico. Its broad, flat expanse was created by the sediments deposited when the continental ice sheets melted. These open grasslands supported the North American buffalo. Once the most numerous and still the most famous prairie animal. And there was a host of other interesting characters who adapted to life in the open grassland. Like the sharp-tailed grouse, the burrowing owl, and the black-tailed prairie dog. While the great buffalo herds no longer roam this grassland, there is one animal that appears to be built for these vast open plains. Pronghorn antelope are the fastest hoofed mammals on the planet. They need a lot of room to run. And they're winners of the evolutionary race. These prairies used to be home to cheetahs and other dangerous predators fast enough to catch them. But the cheetahs are gone, along with many other species.
So these days, the pronghorn sprint on alone. Traveling west from the pronghorn's central prairies, the elevation changes radically. The flat plains give rise to the Rocky Mountains, an unbroken chain over 1,000 miles long, with some of the tallest peaks on the continent. In some places, they stretch almost 300 miles wide. Although this rugged country seems like a tough place to live, there are many amazing creatures here. Bighorn sheep battle for breeding supremacy. Beyond the Rockies, the mountains seem to go on forever. There are a dozen different mountain chains running through British Columbia, Canada's westernmost province, each one strikingly different than the last. The vibrant colors of the Rainbow Mountain Range derive from a process thought to be similar to that which created the color of soil on Mars. And nearby, the Stikine River cuts a great dark chasm through the mountains on its way to the Pacific. More people have walked on the moon than have paddled through this canyon. These vertical canyon walls are the home of more than 300 mountain goats. Sure-footed relatives of the antelope, they seem at ease making their way across treacherous cliff faces. One slip means a long fall to death. The Stikine Canyon provides a truly spectacular mountain goat habitat. The waters from these mountains flow west, carrying great loads of mineral and silt to the Pacific. Here in British Columbia, where the mountains meet the sea, there's a unique combination of elements. Life in this region benefits from the alignment of land and sea. It's the forests that link them together. Canada's west coast is home to a third of the world's remaining temperate rainforest. It is one of the most prosperous habitats on the planet. These trees are teeming with life. It's a magical place filled with rare and strange wildlife. Like the spirit bear, a relative of the North American black bear. He's not an albino. He's a black bear that's born with a combination of rare genes that makes his fur white. He calls these forests home since they provide everything he needs to survive. Each summer, the intricate network of rivers that flow through the forest brings food right to his doorstep. But just like any bear, he has to catch it.
Fishing is a skill that some bears master better than others. This one doesn't seem to be very good at it. His white fur doesn't appear to give him any special status in the bear hierarchy. He's easily pushed out of his fishing spot and forced to look elsewhere for salmon. Maybe that was just the thing to change his luck. They seem so close. Maybe a new technique will do the trick. A surprise attack from above still doesn't work. Finally, he gets one, but he's going to need a lot more fish to fatten up for winter. For centuries, the temperate rainforest region of Western Canada has supported generations of spirit bears. But further north, wildlife has to survive in a far less abundant environment. The north central region of Canada is a vast Arctic tundra. The Canadian Arctic is one of the least dense regions in the world. For a long time, it was thought to be the one landscape that had not changed since the Ice Age. Caribou that live here have to migrate over huge distances just to find enough food to eat. The plants of the tundra are very poor in nutrients. It's hard for animals to extract much from the mosses and lichens that make up the tundra. Caribou are one of the only grazers that can survive on this meager food. But the tundra wasn't always like this. Recent scientific research shows that 15,000 years ago, this environment was in fact a grassland. And grazed by very different creatures than we see in our prairies today. Mammoths. It was a surprisingly productive habitat this far north. That is, until a new arrival. As the Ice Age ended, people pushed into this grassland, known as the Mammoth Steppe, that supported vast herds of grazers. But these people were skilled hunters, and the animals had no defense against them. Within a few centuries, most of the native animals were extinct. Scientists now believe that with the mammoths gone, the grasses died out, causing the ground to turn wet and boggy. And this fertile grassland disappeared. The land turned into the tundra which we see today, making it the biggest human-changed landscape in the country. 15,000 years ago, the tundra was Canada's first frontier. Today, Canada has a new frontier. The Arctic. Sixty-seven percent of Canada's coastlines are Arctic, more than the Atlantic and Pacific coasts combined. Currently, 
the Arctic is undergoing one of the biggest human-caused changes in the history of the planet. Global climate change is melting the Arctic, creating conditions that have probably not been seen here in a million years. but it's a fundamentally different frontier than the past. No one knows how the life of this region will adapt to these new conditions. The changes that the Canadian Arctic undergoes will be felt far beyond the boundaries of this place. They will influence the entire planet. The story of Canada's eternal frontier continues. <laughs>